Welcome, everyone. I'm Harvey Lodish. I've been on the MIT faculty for many, many years. And it's my great personal and professional pleasure to introduce Robert Dotton to you. Robert was a postdoc in my lab 40 years ago, which is a long time. I mean, it was before I think all of you were born. Uh, MIT biology then was building 16 and 56. The old cancer center had just opened. This building did not exist. Whitehead did not exist. It wasn't even thought of. The Koch Cancer Center didn't exist. And a lot of the research in my lab was on dictostelium, which Robert will talk about because that's what he did in my lab and also for a good part of his professional career. He was born in Trinidad, which is an independent nation in the Caribbean, if you didn't know that. And he'll describe quite a bit of his early childhood. He was educated at St. Mary's Colleges in Trinidad. Is that right? It's a high school. Oh, it's a high school. But then he received a scholarship to the University of Toronto, where he did his PhD, and then received a Centennial Fellowship which is given, I think, only to the top five students in Canada each year to come to my lab. So I was delighted to have him. Uh, he'll describe the work he did on very early characterization of messenger RNAs in dictostelium, a typical eukaryote, single-celled eukaryote. He then went to Johns Hopkins University, where he served on the faculty for several years, and then was recruited to Hunter College which certainly in the biological sciences and really in a large number of other areas is the premier undergraduate college of the City University, City University of New York. And he's done outstanding research on dictostelium, which he'll talk about, but also set up a genomics computational biology center at Hunter, which is really the centerpiece for now a lot of work going on in the larger area that includes Rockefeller and Cornell medical schools. And also was very involved in recruiting minorities to Hunter and mentoring them. And then a program I'm particularly interested in learning about, which is Africa. So let me not take any more of my time and leave it to Robert. And Basically, start with your childhood. What was it like growing up in Trinidad? What was your family like? What was the country like? And how did you wind up in Toronto? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Harvey. I feel privileged to be back here at MIT. 40 years seems just like yesterday. And uh, I did postdoc work here, as you know. And uh, I considered Harvey a brilliant scientist, a quick thinking, and very confident. He still is. And inspiring as well and a good leader. And so I benefited a lot from being here. And um, I'm grateful for that opportunity, which really helped my career a lot, as it will yours, when you uh, do your postdocs and, 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 and leave for other pastures. Um, and thanks to uh, Mandana and uh, Linda for making this arrangement. And uh, I'm very grateful to, to be here. I'll talk about my personal journey. I hope it will be sort of interesting and interactive. And please um, ask questions if you like. And, uh, and uh, we'll just go as, as quickly as we can. I'll talk about uh, my early years at, in, in high school and the University of Toronto and then MIT. Then I went to Johns Hopkins. And uh, later on, I moved to Hunter College in the City University of New York, which is where I still am. And some of the successes of the Gene Center that I, I helped to, to develop and uh, the Clinical Translation Research Center, which is a collaboration uh, in which Hunter is a very big part with um, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the um, Wild Cornell Medical College and the Hospital for, spe for Special Surgery. Um, and then, if we get time, I'll get to the Africa uh, section. So I came from Trinidad and Tobago. It's a country with about 1.3 million people. And uh, the dis distribution in the country is really odd. There are about 40% Afro-Caribbean people who live there. It's an independent nation now. And uh, about 40% Indo-Caribbean, who came as indentured laborers after, after slavery was abolished. 
the Africans came as slaves. And uh, indentured laborers just meant that they did the same thing as slaves, but they were granted land after, they were, after, um, after a period of service. And so um, they make up about 80% of the population, and then you have people who are mixed. They call them Douglas. And then there are uh, Europeans and, and Chinese, you know, quite a significant uh, population there. And um, the, um, my, uh, my parents, my mother was a homemaker. Uh, she took care of the four kids. My dad worked as a merchant marine uh, ship's engineer, and he was away for quite a bit of time. We saw him infrequently, but he had a great influence on our development. And um, my first fascination with science that I can remember was when my mom provided what I called a scientific explanation to assuage my primitive fears. I would wake up at night screaming at seeing shadows on the window moving, moving around. And uh, finally, my mother got very sick of that, and she took me uh, in my pajamas out to the street, showed me there was a street lamp out there, there were trees down here, and then there was a window pane. And she indicated that light moved in straight lines, and that caused the, the, um, the shadows that I saw, and that was her scientific explanation. Um, and uh, she pointed out uh, all of these, these features. She was not aware of Schrodinger's wave theory and uh, assumed that it was just a straight line that it uh, moved. But it was sufficient to provide a, a very rational explanation to me, uh, which inspired me in a way. And I still remember that event uh, many, many years later. She's certainly uh, not with us anymore. Um, I cher cherish that rational scientific thinking. My oldest sister, I have two sisters, the older one, who is the brightest of us all, I think, uh, she never went to college. And she has uh, um, managed the family in a way because we are all over the world in a way. And uh, she keeps us in contact with each other. And she, um, she is very aware of all the family issues and so on. I have an older brother who attended the University of the West Indies. And uh, then he went to the University of Illinois. He does personnel management. And um, he has a, a master's degree from, from that uh, University of Illinois. My younger sister is an accountant. She was trained in England and uh, stayed there for many years. Uh, one time, she uh, heard the, the um, long-term forecast on the, wind, on, the, on the radio. And it said that there would be 50 years of bad weather. And then the weather would improve. And that's when she decided to leave England and went to live in Canada, where she still lives now and works. And she's uh, uh, an accountant there. Uh, she lives in Oakville, which is near to Toronto. And my own family is very small. Um, my daughter, uh, technically my stepdaughter, she's now 27 years old. And we just returned from a trip to Oxford and Paris, where she had visited as a child uh, when I was on sabbaticals. And we also went to Barcelona, which was unfamiliar to her. But she could renew this kind of um, experiences. And, uh, and of course, we didn't go to Euro Disney at this time, but we did before. And uh, so it was a very, I don't take vacations very often. And this was one that was very special. And uh, we enjoyed it immensely. My son couldn't come because he was busy um, uh, job, um, finalizing his job hunt and so on. And now he's 23 years old, graduated from the university, uh, American University in uh, Washington, DC. And uh, I raised him as a single parent uh, after I, I got married and then divorced and remarried and so on. And uh, he, um, when I lived in New York, uh, he stayed, he remained with me, and he was three years old at that time, and we've been together since then, for good and bad. Um, he works in a com as a junior programmer now um, in a company that does non-invasive uh, diagnostics from DNA in uh, maternal blood, which of course is a recent phenomenon that you probably know about from work that's been done around here, uh, too. And, um, uh, he's not doing the, um, the biological side, but he's, he's doing some of the programming for, the, um, for that project. So um, 
I say I, I'm a single parent, and I, and I could say that I raised my son by myself, but that's, of course, in quotes. Uh, in reality, it took a whole village in, in uh, a place called Irvington, New York, which is on the, on the river, the Hudson River. Riptan Yes, very so sure. Uh, one village uh, uh, south of, of that, which is um, Tarrytown, and uh, yeah. So, um, and that's where Washington Irving lived, that's true. Um, with some help um, I got from my niece and my cousin and a whole village to raise this child. So naturally I had to be a, both a soccer mom going to all kinds of events and, and to raise, um, and a professional scientist. And we faced a lot of um, challenges, let's say, uh, multitasking as some of you might find in your life uh, later on with kids and so on. Um, but together we went to international meetings and we shared uh, the, uh, the sabbatical in Oxford. He went to school there, um, left his uh, school in Irvington and remained connected by, through the internet. And then he had to, um, and, then, um, and then we returned back to his elementary school. He was about eight or nine years uh, old. And um, he complained, of course, that he had two sets of homework to do. Uh, both in England and, and with his class, which he maintained all these contacts with. I was raised uh, um, in a modest home in Trinidad, middle class, and um, by Trinidad standards, it's probably what you would call low income by American standards. And my parents had a strong emphasis on education and music. And I had limited sk skills in music, although my brother and sister played uh, the piano the violin and the piano, respectively. So um, I turned the pages for the duets that they played uh, for my father and things like that. I wanted to stop playing the piano uh, that I made, and, and so much that I made a, a Faustian deal, uh, which was that if I could stay at the top of my class, they would allow me not to play the piano, to, to drop my piano <laughs> lessons. And, um, and unfortunately, my mother agreed to that, and I stayed at the top of the class. but. Um, now I regret that I'm not a jazz pianist anymore. So that's, uh, that's life. Um, in high school, I was very keen on science. And I took the, in Trinidad, which is sort of a British in its um, educational system, uh, you can, after, in, instead of graduating in what would be your grade 12, you can do two extra years in what's called, a, was then called A levels, advanced levels. And so I specialized in, um, physics, chemistry, and uh, zoology. And um, I, I taught myself uh, calculus in order to learn physics because I wasn't doing math, which is another advanced math, which was other students were taking. Um, I formed a lot of strong friendships then, which I maintained even today. I'm in touch with, with some of my classmates who are now, some of them are retired uh, businessmen, now doctors and lawyers, of course. And, um, and in fact, today I just got some texts from one of them who, uh, who was uh, in, in Toronto at this time. So I think it's important to develop networks and to maintain them with, uh, even among yourselves here now, so that when you go out and you're into science and you start doing um, successes or you need advice and so on, you have these connections that can be very useful. That was one thing that I um, found lacking in, 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 um, among minority scientists because they're so far apart and they're unconnected and so on. And I'll talk a little bit about how one, one solution that I developed for that. The schools in Trinidad were not segregated. And at that time, the Chinese and the whites and Indians and Afro-Trinidadians were equally brilliant, industrious, mediocre, or lazy and, uh, as one another. And um, so we didn't have to worry about uh, Asians beating the curve as people do in, this, uh, in, in here. And we faced no stereotype threat, which was a kind of pressure that women and minorities experience in, uh, in order to try to compensate and to outperform. And it's a way of sort of choking. There's a lot of research that's done by um, Claude Steele on this. And uh, I would recommend that you, that uh, it's a fascinating, his work, book, which is called uh, Whistling Vivaldi, uh, is an excellent um, uh, piece of work on that topic. So um, I went to, um, I received a scholarship uh, from, the, from the 
government to go to a university anywhere in the world. And I chose to go to Canada because I had bad feelings about going to Britain. I knew lots of British people in Trinidad, and I really didn't like their attitude. It was very condescending. And um, I felt that if I went there at that time, I would, it wouldn't be serve me well. I didn't want to come to the United States because at that time there was, it was just in turmoil with a lot of race riots and, and uh, wars and all these things. Not much different from now, actually. Yeah, and, um, so I decided to choose the best university in Canada. At that time, it was ranked 12th in the world, and I went to the University of Toronto. Um, many people think that McGill was, is the best university, but it's not, well, it, it's not that, uh, um, that was not the ranking. So um, I, uh, I ended up in Toronto, and I chose to go to the University of Toronto. Um, and uh, I worked there. Um, I, I was majoring in microbiology, and my summertime, in summertime, I had to find jobs and so on. I worked in, um, as a prospector for a large exploration company which was looking for copper or wherever they could find it or any kind of mineral that was in large bodies. And so I spent the summer working in, in way 400 miles up into northwest Quebec, uh, exploring uh, as a sort of a junior geologist with other people. And on these lakes, a beautiful country, but just riddled with black flies that would eat you through your clothes. But um, uh, it was a very enlightening experience for me. I spent uh, another summer working as a longshoreman, which they called a stevedore, working, uh, loading up trucks with refrigerators and things like that. And, um, uh, and but one summer, I worked with Clarence first who was my mentor in, in, um, for that program, a, a summer program. And many of you have probably had those kinds of opportunities, which are quite transformative. And so I did that. And um, we worked on regulation of gene expression in bacteriophage lambda. And uh, he was an excellent mentor, really very inspiring and very meticulous. I could never be as careful as he uh, was and took, uh, was ext extremely patient. I could never be as patient as he was with me. And so um, that, those were things that were very valuable to me at that time. And I majored in microbiology honors and graduated with first class honors. Uh, I was first in the class and, and of, of, of uh, science and I also was first in the university. And that's how I got this uh, centennial, um, or the Governor General's Medal which was awarded to the person who top. It was like summa cum laude, I guess, is that what you call it here? Yeah. Quote your thing, it's the best degree in the university. So, <laughs> I, I'm Don't not, be modest. Uh, well, I, I didn't say these things to boast about uh, myself, uh, which I'm not reluctant to do, but in, in fact, <laughs> it's, um, it's uh, in fact, I, uh, the point here, however, is that um, in spite of that fact, I later on, um, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that I was well qualified for the things that I was doing. And I think many of you who are women, minorities, and so on, might find that this, this obstacle, that uh, there's a perception after, even in spite of that, uh, depending on the groups that you interact with, that you, know, you just came on a quota or something else like that. And so that's, again, something that in, uh, induces stereotype threat in people because you're trying to compensate all the time to show that you're really different and that you're not really one of those. Or, uh, and, and in fact, there's no reason why you shouldn't be on, on, on a quota in any case if there's some disparity that's, um, that's preventing you from, um, from developing as a scientist. So I got married uh, to my first wife and I continued studies in medical biophysics for my master's at the Ontario Cancer Institute in, in Toronto. It's called, it's called the Princess Margaret Hospital. And uh, there I worked with Clarence first again and Lou Siminovich, both of whom had worked in, with Jacob and Manot. Some of you probably have heard of them, um, Nobel Prize winners in Paris, who, who um, performed uh, a lot of exp um, breakthroughs on operons. I then did my PhD with, in medical genetics at the University of Toronto with Mark Pearson, who was my advisor. And I uh, finished that in 1974. We worked with uh, 
crude extracts and uh, purified proteins, which took a long time. We didn't have restriction enzymes and all these fancy ways of, and no kits. We couldn't buy all the reagents from uh, even the Tris buffer that people buy now from uh, um, these companies at an exorbitant price. Um, so uh, that's how we, we, we did science at that time, in the Stone Age. And uh, I worked on uh, a system that had been developed by Jeffrey Zube at Columbia. And uh, this was to, do, to, to allow DNA-dependent protein synthesis. So you'd take your DNA from Lambda, add large amounts of it to your extract, and in the presence of radioactive uh, pro amino acid, you would see which proteins were made. And uh, you could display these on, on, on gels. And so this, um, Zube uh, was using mainly, had done this to look at some of the um, um, beta galactosidase synthesis and so on. So um, we use this to assay um, regulatory proteins. And uh, we found um, that uh, when we looked at the proteins that were made by of the template lambda. Uh, we saw lots of proteins uh, were made. And if you added some regulators, like the N protein, which is a positive regulator, you could see other, other proteins. It's an indication of what, uh, what genes were being regulated by, uh, what genes were being regulated by the N protein. And that uh, was a, a fairly sophisticated approach at that time in, in uh, using cell extract in vitro. And, um, and that's how we, we really studied um, uh, regulation in vitro. So then we wanted to look at the, um, the effect of the lambda repressor, which, as you know, is a protein that turns off genes. And um, we got purified protein, uh, lambda repressor protein, from Dale Kaiser at Stanford, added this to our extracts, and, um, and and could show that, looking at all the proteins that are seen on the gel, that, uh, that several proteins were turned off as a result. It's in other words, the, the, the system that we were, working was, we were using was working properly, and the lambda repressor was turning off the synthesis of lots of proteins from the DNA template. Um, lo and behold, we saw that another protein was actually being activated and turned on, and synthesized. The more lambda repressor we added, the more of this we saw in its radioactive form. And uh, this was a very important discovery for us. It shows that the lambda repressor induces, it's not just a repressor, but a positive regulator of its own synthesis. We could identify that, that the new protein that was made by, as a lambda repressor by using mutants, uh, templates, and so on. And uh, that meant that uh, a protein which is a, which is a negative regulator for a, lot, a whole set of cascades in gene expression off of this simple um, system was in order to maintain its, um, its uh, functioning, had to turn itself on. And so this, this was a very uh, important example of what became, what, what uh, occurs now with st stem cells and other um, or regulatory systems. You have to have a mechanism to, um, that's uh, um, uh, uh, circular in a way, so that certain proteins, like this repressor, must turn itself on, or it must induce a synthesis of other proteins that will turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, sorry. And in that way, regulatory proteins can maintain their uh, functioning. And this is how stem cells um, as you know from the work of uh, uh, Yamagana, um, on, uh, there are maybe four transcription factors which were required in order to, to maintain stem cells from, um, un from undifferentiated cells. So that was a significant uh, finding. Uh, we did um, write up a paper about this and submitted it for publication before I left. And, um, I spoke about it at many conferences and so on, um, and we, uh, we, I was going to, to come to MIT, and, uh, and of course I had been in contact with uh, Mark Potashny, who had been working on the Lambda Repressor, and um, he, we, we gave him eventually the, 
the, the manuscript of, with our work, but of course we made sure that it was uh, published or accepted for publication. Um, and it's, it's good to do that. Um, and uh, his work on later showed that the repressor actually stimulates its transcription and, and he, has, he developed all of these models of how the switch works and so on and that's a really uh, very exciting work that is important even today because again it maintained, it shows how regulatory proteins like this must be, must have some way of uh, persisting and, uh, and he, of course, argues that, um, that other uh, kinds of modifications which people call epigenetic, uh, and he doesn't like the, the broad use of that term, uh, are not uh, modifications that are sustained or in some cases are even found in, in, um, in flies or, or other organisms um, so that the DNA methylation may not be. And, um, and he's written an article, which I'm sure some of you have read, um, about this, uh, this dilemma and, um, and uh, histone modification may not be specific enough. Reg these regulators are very specific. The lambda repressor is very specific. It turns itself on. Uh, it, it's also specific because it shuts off the expression of a specific set of genes. And uh, methylation uh, is not specific. And so there, I would say that there's a lot more work that needs to be done in order to find out how the specificity is maintained in, um, in epigenetics. So I'll show you a few slides. I sort of jumped ahead. Um, so that's um, my, uh, my son, who's about one year old, observing the computer. And my, uh, my daughter, um, she's uh, about uh, four years old at that time. And, um, and that's, um, that, that's the family. And uh, later on, I'll, I'll be ship, uh, sort of move forward in a time machine, and you'll see uh, there they are. Uh, he's just graduated from uh, American University, and uh, my daughter, is, um, she's now a nurse and still going on to do more degrees. Um, that was a significant um, finding, which we, we published long ago, and uh, with Mark Pearson, who was my advisor, and Lynn Cutler, who was a technician in the lab. And um, so that was called at the time autogenous regulation, and uh, it's, it's autoregulation, and that's what um, many people still call it. Hubert, um, article in 2011 talks about how it maintains memory by transcriptional autoregulation. So um, science is competitive and um, you need to make sure that uh, you publish in, in, in widely read journals and that uh, you know, your work is recognized which means you need to talk about it and, and um, that helps you to get other positions later on. Um, you don't want uh, the impression to be left that uh, somebody who's done, you know, that other people get credit for, for your work. And I'm not, not trying to overemphasize that point. Uh, as you know, uh, George Lumetre, who was the um, uh, uh, astronomer, and an MIT graduate, right, had um, discovered that the universe was expanding. And uh, he calculated the rate at which it ex expands in megapars per second and so on. He was a, a priest as well. He attended MIT uh, for a while in 1927, I believe. And his, um, today, and many, even today, although Lemaitre was um, the major person who did uh, this, this discovery, uh, sometimes the literature gets um, confused, and that, that, those discoveries are often attributed to Hubble. And, uh, be, and I'm not sure why that happened, but uh, it took many years before that was ever corrected. Um, so, and he had a collaborator whose name was, um, was it Friedman? I believe Friedman from, from Russia. 
Lemaitre was from, uh, from Belgium, I believe. And I've never found out how he did at MIT and why he, uh, why he chose to come here. But it's something I'd, I'd, like to exp I'd like to explore. I have a big interest in the cosmos and so on. So anyway, um, I went to, um, I had to decide where I wanted to go. Um, I was attracted by gene regulation, and I read papers by Harvey Lodish. Uh, he would published about uh, dictyostelium being a very important system for looking at uh, gene expression in eukaryotes because it was a simple dif uh, differentiated syst uh, differentiating system. And um, it was very attractive to me. I won a uh, fellowship which is called a Centennial Fellowship in Canada. And at that time, they gave five of them uh, to MDs and PhDs. And I got one of those, and I decided I wanted to come to MIT. I wrote to Harvey, and he accepted me. And, um, and so that's how I ended up here. I lived in Cambridge Port, which uh, it's somewhere around here, I guess. Or, or maybe it's overtaken by all these buildings now, new buildings. On Pearl Street, anybody knows where that is? Oh, so it's still around. <laughs> I remember being uh, sometimes going to Titi the Bear, which is a bar around there, where uh, Bonnie Raitt used to play uh, uh, music. I don't know if these things mean anything to you. It does? Surprise. Anyway, um, so uh, and I enjoyed my time uh, here. I found Harvey, as I indicated before, available, very stimulating, and um, and uh, very um, knowledgeable. And so that, um, those are things which you know, good mentors uh, provide. And um, I enjoyed my interactions. Um, I met uh, John King. Is he still here? He's still here, right? Jonathan King? I was inspired by him. He had a, a very sort of social view about science. And, um, he and John Beckwith, who was in, uh, at Harvard at the time. And um, they uh, encouraged um, a lot of conversation about what science is going to do and what, the, what its social impact might be and so on. And um, I, I, it triggered a lot of thinking on my part. I felt um, a privileged to be at MIT. I was working with some of the best uh, people. And uh, I met a lot of... Uh, very good students, uh, Lydia, Lydia Vilakamaroff was here at that time, and um, Alan Weiner, and Jack Rose, and uh, John Bergman, Pamela Langer was a student. Alan, Jack, and uh, John were, um, John was a student as well with you, but um, um, Alan and Jack were postdoctoral fellows. So I was attracted by the, the promise of dictyostelium it was so simple, and it seemed that it was uh, going to be a very uh, unique uh, developing system because the cells uh, aggregate and form a multicellular organism. And so it, I think it's important to pick the right problem to do. I wouldn't pick dictyostelium if I were doing it now, but uh, at that time it was very important, um, I think. Um, and uh, the reason why I wouldn't pick it now is because the um, the genome is not as stable as it, as it seemed at the time, and many different strains that people were working with had different chromosomes and things like that. It makes it for very confusing. And also, we found that uh, when we tried to do RNA interference, it's, it's very um, um, sort of touch and go. And, but that's, those are things that happen much later, and of course, you, um, you don't know at the time uh, which system is the best one to work on. And, um, and I think that most people here would probably be working on human cells and things like that, which I didn't really uh, see as being um, amenable to the kinds of manipulation that, uh, that uh, you could do then. Now I think uh, many of them can be done. And, but that's not to encourage you all to go and work on human cells. I think that there's a lot to be done, as you know, in things like metagenomics and all of the fields that are so wanting. In, uh, for, for research uh, activities. They were heady, heady times, as I call them. Uh, David uh, Baltimore was there at the time in Building 16, and we had lots of, um, of results coming out of these labs and so on. I did some research on CAPS, 
which were found in the 5 prime end, and that seemed to be really exciting at the time of messenger RNAs, and uh, discovered a different kind of cap that was found in dictyostelium, um, and which was the only kind that, uh, that, that could be found, not the other um, more complex form. And we hoped that this would have some regulatory significance. Um, uh, so we published a paper in Cell, and, and uh, that um, paper um, was, uh, was quite, um, I benefited a lot wait, from that. Be modest it was an important paper. It was at the time. At and the uh, time, but that's the whole point. <laughs> exactly right. And uh, so we did, that, we did that work. It was, um, and uh, we, worked, we had to work quickly. Um, and this is one of the things that, uh, or that sort of frustrated uh, It's a yin and yang kind of thing for me in science. Uh, because I always felt that if I didn't do these, this particular experiment on the lambda repressor or something like that, or on, on caps or whatever, uh, that you know, within a year somebody else would have done it. Because science is moving so rapidly and there are so many smart people there uh, doing it. So in a way, it felt uh, you know, that, well, you know, when are you going to do something that no one else can do? And um, I always felt that kind of um, rub about doing, about doing science. But of course, it's very satisfying and seductive to, to do the um, experiments that I anyway, even if you know that other people are going to be doing them. And so that, uh, for me, I don't know if other people feel that way about um, doing experiments. It, it's not a cynical view, but it really pushes you to, to be very um, uh, efficient and to work very fast and so on. And, uh, but it also means that, you know, are you that special? And, uh, you know, if you have, uh, if you're sort of egotistical a little bit, which I think we all are, um, then you might, um, you know, you, you always want to do something, you know, to have an idea that's really different from everybody else. And so but that those things come very infrequently, don't they? Um, so anyway, we did the work on CAPS and so on, and uh, we published that. And, uh, and uh, it was significant at the time. I, um, at MIT, I was also inspired by um, some, a technician whom, whose name I just cannot remember uh, encouraged me to um, there was turmoil going on in, 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 in Boston. Um, the schools were lousy, high schools, and um, the, the, um, a lot of uh, resistance to busing was taking place. And uh, the person who was adjudicating this whole thing was a judge whose name was Garrity, and you might have heard of him. And he, um, he's died recently, I think. And uh, he lived in Belmont, um, although he was in charge of this district, and, and therefore, um, was um, his responsibility was to decide whether this was a constitutional um, problem and that there was any violation of the Constitution in, uh, that was preventing uh, black and brown people from getting access to quality education, a very familiar problem even today. And um, so he was trying to desegregate the schools in Boston. And I, I, uh, a technician asked me about that and asked me whether I, whether I would be interested in helping in that effort. And uh, um, because the judge needed to get some feedback about what was going on in, in these schools and so on. So I spent a little time, not that much, and I don't know if Harvey ever knew that. I, I did not know that. <laughs> I would have encouraged you, I suppose. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. busing was a huge, yeah. very, very damaging process to Boston, where well, you can describe it. But yeah. So I, I, I went uh, with a police escort into, these, into some of the schools. And uh, in South Boston, which is a dangerous area for people like me, and uh, we, uh, we went into the schools and sort of looked around to see you know, what the physical plant was like and the atmosphere and all those kinds of things, and um, to try to, to provide more factual information. He was trying to get to create magnet schools in which people would um, leave their rundown schools and go to these magnet schools which offered more and, uh, uh, for, for black and white people. But um, there was a lot of resistance to that in, in, in South Boston. 
And uh, I think it's putting it mildly. Yeah. And um, it uh, it was just uh, awful. And it it continued for many years. I my my role was very um, very limited. I went a few times, and I I tried to. To, I, I didn't in, try to intervene. I just had to kind of write reports about what was going on and, and so on. People, well, you know, they knew that I was there um, and why I was there, and so nobody really attempted to, to interfere because, of course, there were policemen around and so on. And uh, not that that's really a source of uh, comfort. So. <laughs> but anyway, the, um, so I made my reports and that kind of thing. That was my contribution. I was really... Um, that was a very important part of my um, political consciousness and my conscience after that. And that was a, a sort of a moment that really uh, changed my thinking um, about education because I, hadn't, um, I had had all this elitist education myself and uh, under never um, really understood until then, you know, how um, privileged I was. And uh, these are the people who were just going to these lousy schools and, and sort of up pitted against each other would never make it as scientists because they never had the kind of resources, uh, exposure, encouragement, and all the other kinds of things that I had had. And uh, so that was really um, uh, um, a moment that changed me. Um, and uh, that bitter struggle ensued for many years, I think, uh, um, there were 100,000 people um, of which in, in, this, in that district, of which about 50, more than 50% were white. And by 1988, uh, it had gone down to like 15% uh, white. People put their kids in private schools and so on. And, um, and the schools, and nothing really changed. And I still don't know what the solution to these problems might be. Um, but, um, it was a first-hand experience that I had, and uh, it was very moving. Just toward the end of my time here, I went to Copenhagen because I had been invited uh, to come there uh, a few years before that, and I went to work in Uli Moller's lab with Niels Feel and other scientists there. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Bill Hazeltine had been there just before me, and they had a program in which uh, scientists would come from America and work for a short time. Um, and uh, that was a very enlightening experience. It wasn't, I wasn't in the sort of pressure cooker environment, and I enjoyed that immensely. I didn't speak Danish, but then I discovered that English is really a, the universal language for scientists. And wherever I lived in, in Europe, in Prague, Copenhagen, Paris, Germany, whatever, um, people didn't, many times they didn't even want to, to um, you know, you're working, collaborating with people, and they would be, they want to learn English too, because that's how they, uh, and so you would struggle to kind of talk in their language, but um, they wanted to hear you speaking in English. So it was a kind of an interesting um, dilemma. I enjoyed that interaction, and then I got back to, to the States and decided, and had to look for a job and so on. Did seminars around the country, went to, um, to, um, and eventually decided I would go to Johns Hopkins University. Um, Phil Hartman and Saul Roseman were prominent uh, people in that department, in the biology department, and uh, they welcomed me. And, uh, this was Hopkins Homewood Campus, Homewood not campus. the medical school. Right, yeah. The medical school uh, was in, on the east, in East Baltimore. The Homewood Campus was in a sort of a pressed, pristine part of the city. Um, and like many medical schools, they, they tended to be in, in, in rather impoverished areas. And again, I was sort of in a select environment uh, uh, where people were very proud of, you know, their place in life and that kind of thing. And, um, oh, sorry. I didn't remember. And, uh, and, and, <coughs> Peter Deveriotis worked in that area, in, in the medical school. He worked on, on um, dictostelium as well. And uh, he had been characterizing receptors of, um, of dictostelium and could show that 
uh, cyclic AMP, which was an external agonist, um, could bind to cell surface receptors and would trigger events in the cell, um, which might result in chemotaxis. The cells all move together to form this multicellular or organism from a single cellular organism. And this was very elegant work um, that he had been doing. Um, and uh, so, and of course, there were other uh, labs like Gilman and so on who were looking at, uh, at the activation by receptors of the synthesis of second messengers in, in the cell. Um, so that's the state of, uh, of, um, of signal transduction at the time. I wondered, um, we were working using marker genes to look at development and so on. And we knew that these genes were turned on during development. And what we, I decided I wanted to look at was to find out whether, in fact, those genes were uh, turned on by the receptor directly. And so we used a lot of analogs of uh, these uh, of cyclic AMP, which was the agonist, and used the ones that were specific only to the cell surface receptor and not to any intracellular proteins, and uh, tried to show that the receptor itself had to be activated in order for, um, for genes to be in induced. Um, and uh, there were no examples, I, I, perhaps one example then, of receptor activation turning on genes. And that was from onco some oncogene. And so we, we, we conducted and designed a whole set of experiments with uh, Badalui, Harry Babu, and myself, who was a postdoc at the time. And, um, and we showed that um, we could activate um, gene expression by uh, triggering the receptors on the cell membrane. Um, and uh, so that was an early paper in signal transduction, which I thought was uh, significant. I think I have a, I put that there. Um, and um, because it showed that uh, a pathway in which cell, which uh, gene induction would take place. Um, later on, we, um, it was difficult to publish that paper because people were so skeptical that that was occurring. And in fact, one person who was a referee later told me that he had decided that this just couldn't be true. And uh, so, uh, even despite the evidence and so on, but uh, I think eventually he was convinced and that's how I got to, to publish a paper anyway. Um, so we, we showed by all kinds of characterizations that, that this was what was happening and that you could get um, cyclic AMP could turn, activate these, uh, these particular genes. Um, I did a little bit of work on, on myogenesis and in fact uh, had an, an, an NIH grant on, on looking at uh, muscle uh, development and myosin and um, creatine kinase during uh, development. I went to uh, meetings in both fields and so on. I remember um, Bernardo Nadal Ginard um, being a, a very prominent figure at that time in um, research on myogenesis. Um, but I, eventually, I, when, once I moved to, to Johns Hopkins, I, uh, to Hunter College, I stopped doing, doing that. So the uh, activation of receptors by um, the activation of gene expression by cell surface receptors was another, um, I thought, was a very important uh, finding. Um, and it wasn't because cyclic AMP was entering the cell and behaving as a second messenger or anything, but it was because it had a specific um, uh, receptor that was also the receptor that Deviotis had been studying to um, mediate uh, um, aggregation and um, chemotaxis. Um, again, it struck me how exciting science is. And, uh, and how, how much could be elucidated by molecular biology. And um, few fields uh, provided uh, the kinds of discoveries that, uh, that, um, that we enjoyed. And, uh, but on the other hand, um, many people would discover these things um, if you didn't do it. And, I'm not, and I was not the first person to, to, to do anything like that, of course, in signal transduction. As I mentioned, Deviotis had been looking at chemotaxis, and, and the biochemistry had been worked out by other people as well. So 
Um, my social activist side continued when I was li living in Baltimore. I, um, I jo joined the Unitarian Church, um, which is a denomination uh, I call Rooted in Doubt, where people um, embraced uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, agnostics, atheists, and many activists. And uh, they, that the Unitarians claimed as members, sometimes erroneously, a lot of people, like John Adams, who was a president, uh, John Quincy Adams, another president, Tim Berners-Lee, who, does everybody know that? Who Tim Berners-Lee is, right? He did the, developed the World Wide Web. Um, and uh, Susan B. Anthony, again, a suffragist and a Quaker. Uh, Sarah Barton, Herman Melville, Cummings, Pete Seeger, everybody knows Pete Seeger, and Whitney Young, Afro-American, um, progressive uh, politish, politician. So thinking about social and scientific issues while I was there, again, led me to um, another kind of um, episode in which I wrote this article in the um, Baltimore Sun. And uh, this article bemoaned the fact that uh, there were so few minorities or blacks in science and uh, that it, science was no big deal, that people, anybody could do this stuff. And uh, at least people from any race could do this. Um, and that uh, there were geniuses in all these populations. And uh, what was holding us back was the, the access to education and, um, um, and opportunities and racism, of course. And, um, and there were statistics which showed uh, that um, blacks in few doctorates, 128 in uh, between 1900 and 1943, and uh, that um, <coughs> there were barely 1% of the total number of scientists, according to the NSF um, studies, and that the pool of graduate uh, students who are black was actually shrinking. Um, those uh, statistics are not um, much different for, for uh, Latinos as well. And um, I wrote this uh, impassioned article which was published in, in The Sun, which is a prominent uh, uh, newspaper in Baltimore and the nation. And uh, George Will, does everybody know who George Will is? Uh, he's a, um, a, a syndicated columnist, um, very conservative. Um, he writes in, all, I'm sure he has a, a, a weekly article um, on the upper pages of um, the Boston Globe, maybe, even. I don't know. But a lot of papers all throughout the nation. He's sort of, you've heard of Maureen Dowd? Everybody heard of Maureen Dowd? Yeah, so, I mean, it's like that. She, you know, she writes and her opinions are sort of published in the liberal, uh, mainly in the liberal press, and perhaps in the Wall Street Journal, too. George Will was a conservative, and he wrote back and said, great article. Um, I, I felt kind of uneasy being complimented by him. But, uh, and he said, why don't you send this article to Reagan, who was the president at that time, and uh, see what they say. So I sent it on to the you know, channels. And then I got back a, a letter from them saying, it's professors like you who are um, causing all these problems and uh, salaries uh, that people are demanding, raises, and so on. It was totally irrelevant, what they, uh, an off base. But anyway, uh, that article, again, was, again, something that, uh, um, not just the, the impact of, of, of the people who might read it, but it really, these kinds of things transform the writer. Um, and um, with my, my penchant for becoming involved in these kinds of things, it further stimulated that. And other people in the nation who um, knew about my, my interests and so on contacted me. Um, so um, that's how I, um, I became much more involved in, in this educational aspect of science. And um, peers uh, 
reacted in a kind of a mixed way at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, some of them um, thought it was very good and good thing to do, and others uh, saw this as being um, too focused on wasting time and educational issues. And uh, as Richard Tapia, who is an American mathematician and Hispanic, says, um, they made it clear that <coughs> they didn't want me to be doing all these other things. It's a choice. I mean, I think that people have to make these kinds of decisions themselves. Um, I, got <coughs> I got from my work and so on, I was recruited to, to advisory groups, which we called study sections at the time, and uh, at the NIH. And uh, at first, I worked on, as an ad hoc reviewer, because that's how you learn the ropes and so on. And I would recommend this to all of you, if you get the opportunity to do that to be on these study sections, because these are the people who determine the fate of your grant application that you've spent months and months writing. And some of them get triaged and thrown into boxes immediately, and others get reviewed. And uh, you need to know the process about how that works. Um, later, I did this for a long stint, which is about four or five years um, after I did the, um, the uh, ad hoc uh, reviewing. and. Um, Few proposals would get funded. It was just amazing. Um, and that's how it is now. It's probably even worse. Um, so you'd write your proposal, and you'd try to make it as tight as possible, and you'd consult other people and collaborate and so on. And uh, I was on this committee. And, and of course, being on this committee, um, I was the only black on the committee, on, on, on my study section. and. Um, I felt at times that, um, and, and other people indicated this to me as well, that they assumed that I was there on a racial quota, and that this, you know, I would have nothing to contribute, really. And so you would have to convince people by your arguments and your knowledge and so on. And although I felt that I knew much more than most of the people in the study section in that topic, um, but I would have to convince them by um, you know, through the arguments and how you'd say, well, this proposal was good, and, and it has these particular th aspects of it whereas other proposals might be lacking and so on. And it's a very competitive environment because there's so much at stake, of course. And um, so again, that, you know, that induces what's called stereotype threat in, 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 the, in the, uh, the person because you have to compensate and it puts more pressure on you and so on. Um, so that's a price that minorities pay for being on study sections and for being in those positions. But I would argue that that's really um, a small price to pay because um, even if you, you did come because they selected, they wanted to have more minorities in the, pop, on the, in the population, it's important to be there in these kinds of decision-making uh, uh, processes so that you can have a role in what uh, priorities are giving to, given to science. Should we pro provide more funding for AIDS or should we provide for something for something that's more exotic? And all these uh, kinds of dilemmas uh, that, have, um, that face people who are in those positions, they have to decide on the future of where science is going to go. And if you're not at the table discussing these kinds of issues, then you're sort of out of the game. And for women, minorities, Latinos, and it's, it's, it's important for everybody to be there. And um, even if you feel stigmatized at times. So, and of course, the powerful institutions would have a, an edge because uh, people knew more about them and it was easier to fund them than the smaller institutions. They had better track records and so on. So, but that's life. And um, the other part of, what I, I, of something that I had said earlier is that you need to have communities and, and, uh, and, and peer groups and uh, people that you can rely on and communicate with who can help you in, in to sort of realize whether you're being paranoid about something or whether there's good reason for you to be concerned about a particular issue, to advise you on, on things and to have these kinds of uh, peer relationship connections. And so it's very important to make these kinds of um, networks. And, uh, um, and at Hopkins, I couldn't do that, except with people in the medical school, because there were more minorities there. Um, Levi Watkins was a medical doctor and a scientist, uh, and he did a lot of um, 
uh, recruitment in, in the medical school. And so um, I met, went to some of their meetings and felt a kind of community and those kinds of uh, things that are so important in your development. You don't want to be in a place where you're so lonely and there's nobody to consult about, well, this paper I'm writing, is it going to be, where should I send it, and those kinds of things. Of course, there are many, many, many um, other peers who are not minorities who are going to be helping you. But some of them don't realize the, the kinds of pressures you may be under. And also, um, there's always a kind of a comfort level that might be established uh, more quickly uh, with, uh, with uh, people of color. So um, that's uh, the study section uh, part of it. I'm going to leave out my parts about, um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, um, an experience I had in, with my son in, in Germany. Um, we went to a conference. He traveled with me to many conferences. And we would sit in the back while the talks were going on especially on a rainy day when he couldn't get outside, uh, we would uh, I'd play chess. We, just, we played a lot of chess. And of course, with chess, you don't have to talk. So I'd make my move, and then I'd look at what's going on, and then he would make a few moves. Some, he, he won frequently because I got distracted by the science. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so, uh, and when it was sunny, he would go outside. And, and in, in this particular place in Ursi, um, which is in Bavaria, in south of Germany. We went to this conference, a genetics conference with the Castilium and so on. Uh, he would go outside with his soccer ball, and then all the kids from the village would follow him, and they'd start playing. He didn't play. He didn't speak English. They didn't speak. Um, he didn't speak German. They didn't speak English. But uh, it didn't matter. That was a common. The soccer was a common language. So he enjoyed that a lot and had fun. Um, and then he discovered uh, at the back of the the. the um, the, this cluster is C. Um, sorry. Um, a sign which was written in German, and, uh, and, and with, it was obviously a cemetery. And he asked me about it, and we looked at it, and then I got it translated, and it said that that was a place where they had buried um, a lot of the people who had been uh, euthanized, and who um, lived um, this this cluster was once a monastery, and then it became a sort of a sanitarium. And they had lived, um, and uh, the, um, the Nazis had um, tortured people. And, uh, and many of them were sent to concentration camps, and some were buried at the back there. And I was just appalled that we would be having a conference here in that place. And it's a kind of a self-righteousness in a way, because um, you know, it, it, it wasn't the fault of the people who were there. But in any case, uh, then a lot of the American scientists I talked to also got riled up about it. And then we protested, why are we having a conference here with all this history uh, behind it? And um, they, um, we spoke to the uh, people who were managing the conference. And they said, well, this is Germany. And uh, it happens everywhere you go. And uh, we didn't know that the conference was, uh, that when we booked the place, we didn't know about this sordid history. You can look it up on the internet. You'll see the story of Cluster Ursi, probably on Wikipedia. But anyway, um, that was a kind of a, um, another kind of moment in my scientific life where, again, I felt that you know, it's really, all these things that while we are working in the labs and so on, there are lots of things that we don't think about. And I, I, I was glad that my son had uh, was a part of that. I took pictures of him and so on, but I could never find the pictures. Um, but um, there were, um, I thought that was a big um, impact. So my involvement with Garrity, the judge, with the Baltimore Sun, with the Cluster Ursi, and so on, were all episodic, individual kinds of um, events, like you might have events today with uh, Eric Garner or Michael Brown. Uh, people uh, with, uh, who've been killed by confrontations with uh, police and so on. You hear about them, and they go away. And uh, then you sort of go on with your life. I thought that I wanted to do something that was more um, long-term and systematic. And I meant um, I had been um, attracted by people um, at Hopkins, at that Hunter College, 
who were in, interested in developing an environment for minorities in science. And uh, I, went, I went there. Um, they asked me to come and to set up um, two minority scientists asked me to come, plus the, the president of the university to take a job there and uh, get, uh, I'm skipping ahead of some things because we're running out of time. And, um, and so I went to, to, to Baltimore. Donna Shalala, was it, anybody heard of her? She was the, um, um, min, the health secretary of health. H.W. Yeah, right. for Clinton, if yes, I remember. Right. She was the president. She was president of the University of Miami. Yeah. She's the um, president of, she was the president of Hunter College at the time. And uh, she recruited me. Uh, we were going to set up an um, environment with a lot of, um, where we'd be making a sort of a multi-racial environment with students and faculty from all kinds of tribes. And they would be working together in, harmoniously. And uh, that was the goal. And so I, I took the job. I negotiated a lot of things very carefully. And I went there, and, um, and we wanted to have a long-term program which would have some impact. And um, about a year later, the people who recruited me, to the two minority scientists who recruited me, left. And uh, they went back to, they went to other places. And so I was the only one there. There was a gene center. There were funds available from a, an NIH grant to try to, 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 to do this project. Um, and I took it over, um, and we wanted to diversify the faculty and to build up the infrastructure and so on at Hunter College. Um, and so I worked on that project, and which was, I, I had worked on that for many years since, since then. Um, many of you might have m uh, grandmothers or mothers who've been to Hunter College uh, in the past, and, uh, or some of you might. Um, there were two Nobel laureates um, who had been there, Gertrude Ellion, who developed a AZT, that's used for blocking um, reverse transcriptase, and or incorporating the um, uh, wrong nucleotides into the, um, into, into the genome. Uh, and um, Rosalind Yallo, who developed the uh, radium munassi. Also, Ruth Teitelbaum Lichterman, had worked on um, things that were called um, ENIACs. That, that, um, in, and uh, that's an electronic numerical and integrator computer. We now call these things computers. And they were used for, um, the first um, computers were used mainly for um, the military to determine how projectiles should be um, launched. And uh, she was a Hunter College um, graduate and she, um, was, and they called those people computers at the time because they were doing the computing, come, um, writing the programs and so on. And um, so anyway, they, it has a kind of a distinguished uh, past and w when it was a women's college. And, but what attracted me was that there was an undergraduate population there was <coughs> that was quite diverse, 50% minorities, including Latinos and all kinds of people. I like that. And I, um, that attracted me. I had an opportunity to go to Princeton as well, and I decided to go to Hunter. Um, so um, I set up a board, an advisory board for my committee, for the, the, the grant I was running. Ken Herewood was a member, John Alderetti, um, uh, Max, a Latino, uh, Max Gottesman, um, and Norma Orwell were on that committee. And I wrote grants to the DOD and got equipment for bioimaging and confocal microscopes and all those other kinds of things. And I recruited people who could do, uh, in order that we could get uh, <clears throat> ELAC accreditation for animal care and, and set up better infrastructure. Um, I wrote a grant to the NIH to build a website, which is what, one of the things that I thought was important, where at this time, at that time, there weren't many websites, by the way. Um, this was, that, what, this was the early 90s then, 88, uh, 90, yeah, early 90s. And we had, um, and that was for doing, getting minorities who were like needles and haystacks all over the country to at least interact with each other. And it was called the Just Garcia Hill site because it was named after three prominent scientists and uh, minorities, Just, E.E. E. Just, who was a developmental biology, um, biologist, um, Fabian Garcia, a Latino, um, agronomist and um, 
Rosa Minoka Hill, a Native American medical doctor. So that's what we did, and we had 4,000 people who joined and interacted and so on, and that helped us in recruiting other people, other people to Hunter, because we, could, we had this network, basically. One of the main elements of success, in my opinion, is to have networks. And so um, we got grants from the NIH, renovated labs, and uh, um, Sidney McNary, who was running the RCMI program there, uh, helped a lot. And uh, we recruited both minority and majority faculty. Mary Philbin, for instance, who was at Hopkins at the time, uh, came to Hunter. She just died recently. Uh, a neurobiologist who's worked on myelin and demyelination, you may have heard of her. And uh, she was one of the people who, an uh, Irish woman. Um, Jesus Angulo, um, who is uh, a member of the um, NIH uh, uh, council, one of the councils there, uh, is, it was recruited in that way. And uh, he's now the, the, taken over my position there as the, the head of this gene center that we formed. Uh, we converted, we, we started our, our symposium series and the, after the first symposium I took over and we've had 25 of them since. International symposia that invite uh, lots of prominent scientists, uh, Nobel Prize winners. We invited David Baltimore, Bob Horvitz, and Phil Sharp all participated in this uh, from MIT. But of course, there were others from different places. These conferences are now a, a significant part of the scientific life in New York annually. And you're invited to come. We installed high-speed networks, local area networks. And also, we developed the first, uh, we, we, uh, we, we arranged to have fiber, which is abundant in the ground in Manhattan, unlit, uh, lighted up so that we could have access to internet too. And we used it for video conferencing, Carlos Leron and I. And we made, uh, use that to do more outreach and to communicate with scientists by interactive video conferencing strategies that we developed. Um, so uh, we renewed the grant. Um, the last time I renewed the grant was about uh, almost three years ago. And um, I have since stepped down from that position. The last award was for 16 million. But uh, it also aggregated um, many other kinds of um, grants that we could uh, get as a result of that kind of growth. And uh, we focused on improving the infrastructure and recruiting faculty in, uh, through these many networks. We expanded the membership to of the people who were qualified to be in it, from just biology and chemistry to psychologists, some psychologists and some even uh, biophysicists. And so we had all these different tribes, as I call them, uh, who were participating in this collaborative environment that would lead to better science. And um, when I stepped down a year ago, I had uh, from one minority scientist among 30, we now have 15 uh, among 50. So we've increased both the, the, the minority and the non-minority faculty um, who are involved in this enterprise, and which has a great impact in terms of uh, productivity, grants received, uh, conferences, published um, papers and, um, and uh, collaborations and all the criteria that you use for success in an institution. Um, and of course, grant funding had uh, risen uh, many fold and so had R01 grants, which are highly coveted. Um, I didn't do much to do the student recruitment. And in fact, Mandana would be disappointed to hear that because I know that she comes to uh, Hunter and uh, recruit students and so on. Some of them have come here to, to um, on summer programs. I know from last year, some students told me that they'd been to, to, uh, to MIT and uh, met Lander and so on, and they were very excited about that. Um, but people like Derek Brazil and um, Vanya Quinones, um, whom I had recruited in, my, in this program, are the ones who you probably dealt with. Um, Vicky Lewin as well. Um, but I didn't recruit her. So there's some um, progress, and we made some impact, I think. And uh, I think I have a picture of that. Uh, let's see if I can find that among. Oh, sorry. Well, I'll show you that in a while. Let me just get back to this um, Africa thing. Using our video conferencing strategies that we had uh, developed, uh, we could use uh, from some of the classes that I held. Do I have a pointer? 
Oh, yeah. In my own bioinformatics classes, we, do, we sometimes do this kind of format in which this is all people in different locations. This guy is in uh, Nevada. Um, these people are in Africa. Um, and uh, these are people in different parts of Brooklyn. And we're talking about some bracket or some problem. But they all have headphones. And, they, and we use software, which we mail, email to them, and they can connect. It's not Skype, because you can't do some of this stuff with Skype. And uh, we would have these um, get input from different places, which is important, again, because you don't have all the expertise in one place. And you can rely on, on other people who are willing to collaborate and to, to have an input, and so on. And that's how we started doing that. But then we went um, uh, the H3 Africa project is one that's funded by the National Institutes of Health here, and also the Wellcome Trust in England. And there, the goal is to try to develop, to study heredity, health, and humanity in Africa that Africans would be involved in, in finding out about their own um, origin and so on, and their genomes, which is really important. And so this is a huge genomic process, uh, project that's funded uh, to uh, South Africa, um, Addis Ababa, um, Nairobi, um, uh, Abuja, which is in, in uh, Nigeria and other places. There are about 10 sites and nodes, and these are developing to teach bioinformatics. And uh, we've helped to set up an environment where they can communicate and do this kind of video conferencing um, in spite of some of the infrastructure problems that they may have. And so there's a, I think I have another slide here, yeah, which shows the, um, the here's Carlos, um, my colleague who, who was at that time in Nairobi helping them. Uh, sorry. Am I getting? Carlos here. And then um, they, there are experts from, from Europe who came down to, Ni to Nairobi, I believe, and were giving workshops on bioinformatics. And, um, uh, and they, we, we could um, relay those um, interactive sessions to Abuja in Nigeria and Ibadan and other places so that they could take part in the lessons and uh, in the conversations and you could see each other and, and so on, and multi-point video conferencing. And so that's um, an example of a session. We've also used this with the Clinical and Translational Research Center, which we formed, well, which we were in, involved in, that involves, as I mentioned earlier, Wild Cornell Medical College, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and Hospital for Special Surgery. They were awarded a huge grant to to promote translational research. And we were a part of that grant. And so that allows us to integrate our research with what's going on at, uh, at those places, a very valuable um, um, relationship. And that's important because now um, we've, we have these kinds of very tight relationships and collaborations with people in um, Sloan Kettering and in, in, in uh, Cornell and so on. And so there's a lot of exchange, because we are providing basic research. And uh, there are people with whom you can collaborate. Physicists there work with, um, have worked with, um, physicists at Hunter have worked with um, ophthalmologists to find new ways of doing pulse, of, of uh, doing um, um, imaging of the eye to look for tumors and so on. And they develop methods that are tenfold more sensitive than pulse echo using lasers. Um, to generate the sound for, um, for uh, imaging. And uh, we have nanotechnology uh, people in chemistry department who have um, ways of finding cells, uh, detecting cancer cells without biomarkers based on their elasticity and their ability to, to um, expand uh, in uh, isotonic medium, which could be sensed by looking, using Im Im um, looking for changes in impedance. All of these strategies. Um, require contributions from uh, hunter scientists and collaborations with people in the medical school and in, in, in the medical schools around there. And so uh, um, translational research is a very important area. Even though when we started, I got a lot of pushback from people who were saying, oh, Zahuni, who was the um, head of the National Institutes of Health at the time, He's in charge of scientific, of uh, translational research 
And when he goes, so will uh, translational research. And they objected because many of them had individual collaborations with people at Rockefeller or some other place and didn't see the value of having a system in which people could collaborate um, uh, uh, within it and still have um, get access to, to patients and samples and so on and IRBs, permissions, that you wouldn't otherwise get if you were just collaborating with one person. So we set up this kind of arrangement. And it's been, of course, done in many other colleges um, now. It's a good model, I think, for, uh, and you, MIT probably has some translational research uh, uh, projects, and it's a good model for um, integrating the research from one institution uh, to another. Um, and in this case, Hunter College benefited from that. And it's benefited to the extent that now our president has bought a floor on one of the new buildings in the um, in Weill Cornell Medical College into which some of our people who are working on prostate cancer and so on will go. And then there's a new building that's being constructed on FDR um, highway um, in that same area where Memorial Sloan Kettering will have one tower and, uh, and Hunter will have a tower in which the scientists will be there and nurses, the, the School of Nursing. And so there's a lot more collaboration interaction and that um, that's uh, an activity that uh, she can justly claim um, um, credit for, for, for pushing on. Um, so those are the kinds of interactions and, and, and uh, events that have um, arisen from, from the kinds of uh, relationships that I described. We do uh, outreach by, um, we, we, we've de we're developing a strategy of doing um, um, preventative medicine by getting doctors who come into Hunter um, and sit in the studio that we've built, and they can do video conferencing to people in many different sites at the same time. And they talk about diabetes um, to people and uh, in different communities and uh, get feedback from them. And then we try to track whether the, there's any, inf uh, whether they have, uh, it has had an impact on their behaviors and whether in fact those, um, people who have been exposed to this kind of information and interaction have transmitted things, information to other, their friends and family. Um, we're testing hypotheses about models like that have been developed by Christakis and Fowler from Harvard about how um, obesity, for instance, is can be transmitted, they claim, by um, like a disease or like a viral from people to other people and so on who, with whom they contact and how connection works and how influence can be transmitted. And you can do that with looking at, at uh, prevention of diabetes and so on. So those kinds of strategies are still being uh, employed now. So it's been quite a, a long, uh, uh, exciting uh, journey in science. These are some of the people, the motley crew as I call them, of scientists who uh, we've recruited. These are members of the Gene Center. Um, it, the pictures are maybe a year or two old now. But um, they, it's, a, it's a far different group of scientists than when I came there. And uh, that's one of the things that I, I, I um, am proud of. And, uh, and I think that that could be a model for science um, in other places and in this country. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much. I think you can see why, on one hand, it was so much fun and excitement having Robert in the lab, and how much important influence he's had on science in the United States and organization of science in the United States. You'll take a few questions from yes, the group? Yes, sure. Anyone? Yes. yes. So on, on the also on campus at Harvey's lab, can you share us uh, some of your experience? What was the Harvey's lab looks like 40 years ago? Oh, no. sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what it looks like now. But uh, you know, it was a small, uh, um, w well, by sta uh, con uh, contemporary standards, it was a big lab. And um, I'm sure it's much bigger now. And, uh, there, and David and Harvey shared the same um, uh, um, domain, sort of, and space. They had their offices there, David Baltimore, that is. And, uh, and we interacted a lot with, with, uh, 
with, with people. There, were, um, there was always somebody in the lab. People were working day and night, and it was very in inspiring. And uh, people teased me because I think the bench that I was working on was the one in which um, reverse transcriptase was developed. And uh, this is a hard act to follow, right? <laughs> and uh, it was discovered there. That, that's where um, uh, Sir David Baltimore had worked there and so on. They I, also I, I just have to add, before you came, <laughs> the first cDNA library ever was made by Inder Verma using dictostelium DNA. Yeah. Just and to so, show you where we were working. Yeah. But keep going. And uh, so it was, um, it was a very exciting time. I, I, um, I distinctly remember coming back to the lab many times at night because I, you know, I'd put my samples on the ice bucket and so on, and I had this recurring kind of event where I would think, did I put the samples back onto the, um, into the refrigerator? I wake up in the middle of the night. It's like my childhood um, nightmare with the shadows on the window. And then I would get up, jump into the car, and drive off. It wasn't very far, but of course, at the middle of the night, I wanted to get back. And I'd come in, and there would be people in the lab still. And um, then I'd see that the, I had, in fact, put the sample away. And the bucket was just sitting there with water in it. And that was, I, I imagine it may have happened to some of you as well. But um, <laughs> that was, or perhaps now you have these um, gels that uh, you know, last a long time, and they don't melt away, and your tubes don't go floating away in, in them. But um, there were a lot of bright people, as there are now. I mean, that's one of the great things about being at MIT. You just, you know, there are more geniuses per square inch than almost anywhere else on the planet, right? And so you can exchange ideas and in interact with people and, and really benefit from those kinds of conversation. It's also a very competitive environment. And uh, that's part of, uh, of doing science. I enjoyed it. I, I really, um, at, at times, of course, it was stressful. And uh, then you, you know you have to get your papers out and those kinds of things, which are really uh, tough at times. And your experiments have to work, or you need to switch topics and so on. And, but those are always things that I think you have, you experience even now. Um, Harvey was very supportive. I'm not just saying that because he's there, here now. <laughs> let, let me ask you a question I always wanted to ask when you were leaving the lab, but never did. You interviewed at a lot of places. Yeah. And you interviewed at a time when affirmative action was really just beginning in the 70s. Describe some of your experiences. Because I remember you coming back and telling me you weren't always treated as a scientist. Um, I think that's sort of par for the course for me. In, in, um, but I, you know. The place I went to places like Caltech and gave seminars, and um, you know the experience was quite good. I met uh, Davidson and uh, talked with him, and uh, I thought it was very candid uh, kind of discussion and so on. There were other places that I won't mention or name where I thought, uh, you know, why am I here? You know, these people um, are looking just to find. Uh, um, they want to have um, say that they interviewed some minorities or something right. like that, and that kind of thing. Um, and they didn't, they weren't sort of interested in the science as, as, as much as I was. And uh, I, you know, I just, my temperament wasn't one that sort of tolerated any tokenism and that kind of thing, which is why I, I ended up doing all the things that I did in, in, with respect to minorities in science. And it's good to see uh, um, the uh, quality and, and the number of people who have come in now t into this, this arena and how diverse it is. So there were good um, uh, incidents and, and, and some that were challenging. Um, but uh, I felt very privileged because I had already been isolate, uh, insulated from, um, by being educated uh, the way I was. And it wasn't like, um, and, and I feel for uh, African-American and Latino people who are coming up and have to, to, to put up with this nonsense. Um, I think it's diminishing a lot. There's a lot more um, um, momentum to, to try to recruit people and to train them and so on. But when you read the newspapers now and you look at the, the kinds of things that are going on outside of the lab, 
uh, you know, on the, in the streets, people walking down and getting arrested for, uh, in a Walmart for having a, um, a BB gun, which he picked up from the, from the store itself and shot. Those kinds of things are just unbelievable, unacceptable. And it's America, that's where we live, and that's our country. I feel very dedicated to it, and uh, um, so it's a good and a bad. question. Um, I don't know. I think, um, I believe that you're, that you're right, that a lot of what drives you is your ego and your desire to do um, something unique and different and, uh, and that, uh, you know, exci that's exciting to you in, in a particular field. Um, I don't consider myself in the same class as Richard Feynman or anything, but um, I think that that's a very valuable kind of motivating element um, and it, it's not, um, it can of course be, um, become a, a sort of a, a destructive uh, force, but for most people I think it's, it's, it's normal to have those kinds of desires and to try to seek to, to do something that no one else has done. And, um, and in a way it's a little bit frustrating, but I think it's very important that your work becomes um, discovered or right after or someone else does the same thing. That ratifies or confirms that it's really um, uh, sound, sound science. And, and I, I don't consider myself as, as being you know, a, an outstanding stellar scientist or anything, but uh, even um, as I went along, I felt that that was a very important uh, part of, of the process. And I, I'm sure you will too as you, you go along because um, I think that's what drives you. Um, it, for some people, it's more, <coughs> it, excuse me, especially among scientists. I mean, for some people, it's money. You know, you go into business and you set up something and you, and you feel great about that. But uh, for other people, it's just that kind of uh, curiosity and playing with ideas. And, and that's what we're trapped in. That's what we feel. That's what we do. Yes. Advisors, pictures, slides. Who's that? Hiroshi Matsui. Oh, Matsui, yes. Yeah. He's a great guy. So, so I know you for a long time. Yeah. I have a question. I'm moving to Texas Tech as faculty. So I wonder is how do we get like a like review, like a proposal review, or how to get this kind of advisor board? How do we get like connect proposal review, or like how do we connect program managers? Like what do we do? Like, do you mean program? How do you get connections with, with people who are potential reviewers yeah. or might help you in that? Yeah. I mean, I think that now there's a lot more uh, networks like LinkedIn and so on. I would advise all of you to, to, to be a member or to join up in those kinds of things. Um, there's uh, Mendeley, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, where you can share a lot of, of journals and, uh, and find people who are interested in your work in different parts of the world because they have all these interactive groups and so on. Those kinds of networks are, of, of course, very valuable and important. Uh, Matsui is a great colleague. I, I, know, he, I spoke about his work. He's the one who had developed these um, methods of nanotechnology in which you can um, find cells that are cancerous and detect them in very small concentrations because they tend to have uh, more elastic properties. And you can measure in hypotonic medium 
the changes in impedance that uh, some cells lice and others don't, and you can, and he's got these uh, fantastic methods of doing that. He's looking at now for prostate cancer cells in urine, things like that. These are all very important developments, and in collaboration with people in the medical, in uh, Wild Cornell Medical School. I'll tell him I saw you. Robert, thank you so much. Thanks. And inspiring. Thank I think you've inspired a large number of people, so thank you.